Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. If you are visiting with us, as always, we're grateful for your presence and hope that you will be able to be back with us uh, very soon. I see uh, Brittany, Morris, and Ryan have joined us, and we're glad that they are here. Uh, be sure to welcome them. They're new Christians, and we're glad that uh, they decided to obey the gospel and to do God's will. So we rejoice in that. I uh, wanted to also uh, mention last night we had a gathering here at the building, the Saturday, the Sunday night live on Saturday night. Uh, and um, I was told by Amy that I needed to mention that the Little Rascals won. Uh, that, that team won everything last night, so I was told it was important for me to mention this morning. But nevertheless, we're grateful for all the presence of, of those that were there last night and especially this morning as we worship our God together. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In 1789, when George Washington was giving an address, or an address, I should say, he said these words, Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor, and whereas both houses of Congress have, by their joint committee, requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many, the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore, I do assign Thursday the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of the United States to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be. That was, again, George Washington, 1789 Thanksgiving Proclamation. This week, citizens all over our country will observe a day on the calendar known as Thanksgiving. And as George Washington's words demonstrate, observing this day goes all the way back to the early years of our nation's history. At the same time, well, I should say in 1789, that was a long time ago. Now, at the same time, that day was set aside at least to commemorate the time when the Pilgrims set aside a day in 1621 at Plymouth Colony to thank God for his bountiful harvest following the harsh winter of 1620 in which many died during that time. So think about that. 1789. You know, that was a really long time ago. Uh, go back further than that. 1621. That was even longer ago. And yet the concept of Thanksgiving goes back much, much farther than those dates. You see, God is the one who originated the concept of Thanksgiving. It's not a holiday that man put on a calendar. That's really not what Thanksgiving is. Thanksgiving is something that we are to engage in on an ongoing basis. And so since this time of year affords us the opportunity to talk about God's concept of Thanksgiving... I thought it might be good for us to remind ourselves how the Christian is to be thankful for all of God's blessings all of the time. And so let's notice this morning some reasons why, from the Bible, that Christians are to be thankful. Let's consider in the first place this morning that being thankful fulfills a command. Being thankful fulfills a command. And when you think about how God has talked about thanksgiving in the scriptures, we recognize that one of the things that he said is that we do need to be thankful. He has, in fact, commanded us to be thankful for our blessings. And we see that, number one, God commanded this for his people under the Old Testament. 
God commanded thankfulness for His people under the Old Testament. In Psalm 100, verse 4, we read these words. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. So we can see that thanksgiving is by no means a new concept. It is not a modern concept. It did not begin to be important, in other words, when men decided to set aside a day on a calendar to commemorate what the pilgrims did in 1621. No, God has always desired His people to show gratitude for their blessings, which obviously come from God. And so there is this command for folks to enter into His gates. The gates of the temple is what is being referred to in the Old Covenant. The gates of this temple enter into the courts of the temple with praise and be thankful to Him. Well, why? Well, it talks about why in the very next verse in Psalm 100 verse 5. Why do we need to be thankful? Why do we need to offer thanksgiving? For number one, the Lord is good. Also, His mercy is everlasting. And also, His truth endures to all generations. Certainly reasons to be thankful. In fact, if you go to a few Psalms later, in Psalm 118, verse 1, very similar. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? For He is good, and His mercy endures forever. And so we see that we need to be thankful for the wonderful blessings that God has given, and God has always told His people to be mindful of them. And so in showing thanks, there is an awareness of the fact that one did not get something on his or her own. It had to be given to me. We cannot have God's mercy, one of the things were to, that they were commanded to be thankful for, we cannot have God's mercy by our own means, by our own merits, or by our own good works. God has to give us mercy. And nor is there any sense in which we ever could deserve God's blessing of mercy. I've always loved the prayer that Jacob offered in Genesis 32 and verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. And he mentions one of the blessings immediately, for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I've become two companies. God had blessed him with family in so many ways. But he said, I'm not worthy of that, nor are we, nor could we ever be worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth that he has shown us. And so God, we see, commanded thankfulness for His people under the Old Testament. Well, it goes without saying that God commanded for God, His people to be thankful under the New Testament. Thankfulness is commanded for God's people under the New Testament. As Paul was writing the church at Ephesus, one of the things that he did was he noted some things that are not to be characteristic of Christians, in other words, things that they are to avoid. He said in Ephesians 5 verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints or Christians. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather what is supposed to be fitting for Christians? What is supposed to be named among us? Rather, giving of thanks. That ought to be a characteristic of Christians. We are folks who give thanks to God for His blessings. And so all of these evil things, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, that's not to be named among us. But rather, giving of thanks. Something that's both becoming and befitting of Christians. And furthermore, Paul went on in the very same chapter to talk about some very straightforward instructions for the church at Ephesus. Notice they were to walk a certain way. In other words, they were to live a certain way. He says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. They were to use their time wisely, Ephesians 5, verse 16, making the most of your time. 
Old King James redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. They were to understand what the will of the Lord is. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So he's giving these straightforward instructions about their lifestyle. They were not to be filled with wine, but the Spirit of God. Ephesians 5.18 And do not be drunk with wine, or literally stop doing this behavior, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. They were to engage in singing. In the congregation to one another, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. In other words, worshiping God. And then he says, they were to be thankful to God always for all things. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the midst of all of this way that they were to live, and by extension all Christians are to live, and also looking at the worship in verses 19 and 20, among that would also be giving of thanks. And notice here in verse 20, not just one day out of the year, giving thanks always. For all things. And so when we think about the idea of thanksgiving as God has put it for us in His Holy Word, as God has described it in His Holy Word, we know that number one, thanksgiving fulfills a command. We are to be thankful always to God for all things. But in the second place, let's also notice that being thankful encourages contemplation. Being thankful encourages contemplation. If you go to the dictionary and you find contemplation, you'll find it means to think long about something. Or to have reflective thought regarding something. So there's some time spent, in other words, carefully thinking about something. And so when we're talking about thankfulness, of course, we are talking about, as we sang this morning, Counting our many blessings. We're giving some time and attention and thoughtfulness to the blessings that God has given us. Why is it so important for us to contemplate or to think about very carefully and reflectively our blessings? Well, number one, it should go without saying, it's because there is danger in forgetting. There is danger in forgetting. Think about the nation of Israel for a moment and how they had come through some very difficult times as a nation, God's people. What a tremendous blessing God gave to Israel by delivering them from Egyptian slavery and giving them the land of Canaan. As the Israelites were traveling through the wilderness for that 40-year period, 40 years was their own fault, of course, because they did not listen and believe God. But nevertheless, even though they had been punished by having to go through the wilderness for 40 years, even so, God still took care of them along the way. When they were hungry, He fed them, even though they were complaining. In Exodus 16, verse 13, so it was that quail came up at evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. And so he supplied the manna in the wilderness, bread to eat for when they were hungry. When they were thirsty, he gave them water to drink. Exodus 17, verse 6, God tells Moses, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Later on in Numbers chapter 20, verse 8, even though Moses disobeyed on this occasion, and it cost him his uh, privilege of going into the promised land, the land of Canaan. Nevertheless, we see in Numbers 20, verse 8, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, that's what God tells Moses and Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So God made sure they had food. God made sure they had water to drink. 
All the while they were traveling through the wilderness, their clothes and their shoes did not wear out. Deuteronomy 8 verse 4, Moses reminds them of this. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Well, it would be wonderful if we had clothes that lasted 40 years. That would slim down our wardrobes and our closets, wouldn't it? Their clothes never wore out. Their feet didn't even swell, no matter all the trekking across the wilderness they did. All the while, God was going to bring them to a land that was completely furnished for them. You think about that. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities. Notice, which you did not build. Houses full of all good things, which you did not fill. Hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. Everything's ready for you. Everything is going to be there for you, and you're going to be provided for abundantly. Isn't that amazing? How God supplied all the needs of his people. When they arrived there, they had everything ready for them to go and to continue serving God. But they were warned about getting caught up in the blessings and forgetting the blesser, the one who blessed them in the first place. So as you continue to read in Deuteronomy 6, verse 11, when you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And as we know, they did forget God, sadly. They forgot and they went off into idolatry, eventually leading Israel into being taken into Assyrian captivity. Later, Judah followed with Babylonian captivity. Why? Because they forgot God. They forgot their blessings. You think about the Gentiles, as a matter of fact. You know, we're talking about Israelites and, of course, Jews as well. Jews being from Judah. You know, and how they forgot their blessings. But, you know, it's interesting when you read about Paul's description of the Gentiles, those that were outside of fellowship with God, those that were idol worshippers by their history. Evidently, though, that was a choice that they had made because Paul says because although they, although they knew God, talking about the Gentiles, they did not glorify Him as God, notice, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Isn't it amazing how thankfulness can prevent departing from God? So this is important stuff. This isn't just eating turkey type stuff. This is important. This is talking about we need to be mindful of our blessings. Because there's danger in forgetting. And so we would do well to take heed to the words of Psalm 103 verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all His benefits. We need to be mindful of our blessings. Forgetting God's blessings, as, as we have demonstrated, will push us away from God. But remembering them will draw us closer to God. And so we need to give careful thought, contemplation to our blessings because there's danger in forgetting. But then number two, there is, of course, blessing in remembering. There is blessing in remembering. One of the things that we can gain from remembering our blessings is something a lot of people deal with. And that is that when we remember our blessings... It helps us to alleviate anxiety. Alleviate anxiety. You know people who struggle with anxiety? In Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing. So how do I handle that, Paul? How do I handle worry? How do I handle anxiety? But in everything by prayer and supplication, notice, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So in our prayers, we need to be thankful for our blessings. And someone said, according to this verse, when the tough gets going, the Christian gets praying. 
We need to be mindful of our blessings. Yes, we ask God for our needs, but we also thank, for, thank Him for our blessings. Also, there is blessing in remembering because it produces peace that passes all understanding. That's what Paul talks about next. If we go to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and we let our requests be made known to Him, what happens? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In times of difficulty, in times of distress and challenges, when we thank God, it can change our perspective on life. To give thanks for what we have instead of focusing on what we don't have. It will change our way of thinking to give thanks for the successes rather than complain about the failures. And so we need to be thankful because, again, it encourages contemplation. And then in the third and final place, we need to be thankful because it acknowledges care. It acknowledges care. One of the things that thankfulness does, number one, is that it recognizes God's help. God shows his care for us in that he helps us so much. You might recall in Luke chapter 17, there is given for us the account of the ten lepers, not leopards, but lepers, who had begged Jesus for mercy. In Luke chapter 17, verse 11, it says, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. <clears throat> then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So, you know, the, the skin disease of leprosy was something that isolated those who had it from everybody else. To the Jews, you were unclean and they couldn't be around you or it would make them unclean to the point where they couldn't go and worship God according to the law of Moses. And so people avoided those who had leprosy for fear of perhaps getting it themselves. But also, if it was a religious matter under the law of Moses, they had to stay away to keep themselves clean ceremonially. And so here's these ten lepers and they're crying out to Jesus. Have mercy on us, Master. And so what is Jesus' response in verse 14? So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And while all ten of them were healed, only one came back and gave thanks. Luke 17, verse 15, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his on his face at his feet, that is Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. In John 4, we know that Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. They didn't look upon Samaritans very favorably anyway. And here was one that had, a leprosy, had leprosy on top of that. And so no doubt they would have avoided him for both of those reasons, but that was the only one that came back and gave thanks to Jesus. And you know what? Jesus even pointed that out. So Jesus answered and said to his disciples, Were there not, not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? So Jesus even wanted it to be pointed out how unthankful the other nine were. How do you think God feels when we don't thank him for his blessings? It's a good thing. Do you like it when you do something for someone and trying to help them and they don't even acknowledge what you've done? You know, it bothers me, and it doesn't bother me forever. It just bothers me for a minute. But, you know, when you go somewhere to a store or a restaurant and you open the door for someone, they don't even acknowledge, you know, thank you for holding the door for me or something. And that, that's a little bit bothersome, isn't it? I mean, not that we're seeking recognition or that we're just trying to make ourselves look good, but just out of just plain old respect and politeness, just to be nice about it. So thank you for that. Well, this is a lot more than just holding a door for somebody that Jesus did. 
Jesus helped ten lepers, all ten of them. And, you know, and think about, again, what this meant for these folks, these guys that had leprosy. Because, again, these were isolated people. No one wanted to have anything to do with them because of the leprosy. And so what Jesus did is not only did he heal them of their leprosy, but because of that, it would forever change their lives. They could have associations with people. People would want to have relationships with them and be friends with them and want to be around them. And for however long they had that leprosy, that was not going to happen. And so Jesus fundamentally changed their lives forever because of what he did for them by healing them of their leprosy. And only one of them acknowledged the fact that the Lord helped. How sad that is. And so when we think about thankfulness... We, we, in doing that, are recognizing God's help. But not only that, being thankful recognizes God's desire to help. He helps, but not only that, He wants to help us. In 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning of verse 6, Peter writes, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him. Why? For He cares for you. God cares for us. And God has always wanted for His people to trust Him to relieve them of their burdens. So this concept that Peter's pointing out is, is, again, not a new concept. God has always wanted us to cast our burdens on Him or cast our care upon Him. Going back to the Old Testament in Psalm 55, 22, Cast your burden on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Again in Psalm 62 and verse 8, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart to him or before him. God is a refuge for us. God wants us to pour our hearts out before him. Now he knows our hearts before we say a word. But it acknowledges his desire to help. It acknowledges his care for us when we express to him. Our deepest needs, we're at the same time saying, God, you're the one who can meet those needs. You're the one who can help. And when he lifts those burdens for us, how can we do anything else but give him thanks? Of course, the greatest burden that God lifts for us is the burden of sin. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus describes sin as a heavy burden. Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, laden down with your sins, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Have you allowed Jesus this morning, if you're not a Christian, to lift that burden of sin? If you've never believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24. Or maybe you believe that, but maybe you've never repented of your sins, even though God commands all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17, 30. And you've never confessed that belief that you have, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. And you've never been immersed into water for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 22, 16, having them washed away. You're still carrying that burden. God desires to help you with that burden. That's why He sent His Son to die. To lift that burden from us so we wouldn't have to carry that sin any longer. And we, out of thankfulness for that sacrifice, ought to respond in obedience by obeying the gospel through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. For those of us who are Christians, are you thanking God on an ongoing basis for His blessings? Or do you think that Thanksgiving is about turkey and cranberry sauce? If that's all it's about, then you've missed what God says about thanksgiving. And so we need to be thankful for our blessings. Maybe because we haven't been thankful, as we talked about this morning, we have forgotten those blessings and it has led us into sin just as it did with Israel. The response of the Christian is to repent of that sin, Acts 8, 22. Confess that sin, 1 John 1, 9. And God will forgive us as Christians if we go to Him in that manner.
And so this morning, if you're subject to the invitation of our Lord, and we can help you in obeying Him, would you come forward as we stand and sing this invitation song? There's a fountain free is for you and me.
who is willing to come to the cross and die for our sins and have his body broken for us, Lord. Lord, at this time, as we look at this, we have to represent that broken body, Lord. May we examine ourselves and take it away busy today. In Jesus' name. Two here in person, 26 online for a total of 108 this morning. We're seeing this closing song and then you dismiss.